are listening to Walk It Out with Trisha Goyer, where we discover what it looks like to follow God and be swept away on the journey of a lifetime. Author of over 70 books, mom of 10, yes, 10, homeschooler and speaker, Trisha Goyer will explore what radical obedience to God's word looks like. It's time to hear from God lovers who've dared to say yes. Listen in to Heart to Heart Chats and learn how others overcame doubts and fears. Discover how God used ordinary people to impact others one step at a time. If you're ready to get radical, get going, and make a difference in this world, you're at the right place. Here's your host, prolific writer, world traveler, people lover, and mega nap taker, Trisha Goyer. Well, hey, friends, welcome back to Walk It Out. I am so excited because this is a friend, a real life friend that I've met with and chatted with, and I've been such a big cheerleader of her and her messages and all God is doing through her. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Felicia Masonheimer teaches Christian women how to apply faith to the realities of life. She's a blogger, podcast host, and speaker. Her writing focuses on overcoming sin and difficulty by the power of a maturing personal relationship with God. She lives in Northern Michigan with her husband and adorable little children. So welcome, Felicia. Thanks so much for having me on, Trisha. It is so fun to be holding this book in my hands. I remember talking with you at a homeschool conference and just, you know, talking about publishing and writing. And I was probably like three years ago, three years ago, yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah, and maybe, let's see. It might be, yeah, three, three and a half, somewhere around there. Yeah. And I just love, and I remember going home and like looking up what you were doing. I'm like, okay, yeah, this is someone I totally, totally want to be a cheerleader for. And I just love all that God is doing in you and through you. So just give us even a little bit more just who you are for my listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, we met at a homeschool conference quite a while ago. And um, that was kind of at the beginning of my own writing and ministry journey. I'd been writing for a long time. I've been blogging for over 10 years, but kind of as a side thing, as a hobby. And right around the time that we met um, in your writing from home class that you were teaching at that conference, I was trying to kind of shift to writing more intentionally about theology and Bible mm-hmm. teaching and things like that. And so since then, that is what I have been doing. And my recent book is kind of the culmination of that. So most of what I do on my blog, podcast, and my social media is teach theology for the everyday woman, the woman who probably won't go to seminary or you know might not go to Bible school, but wants to know what she believes and why she believes it so she can explain it in her daily life, to her kids, to her coworkers, to her family. Um, So it's basically a a lower level apologetics, um, doctrinal teaching, and it is so much fun. I love it. (laughs) I love it. And the book is Stop Calling Me Beautiful, Finding Soul Deep Strength in a Skin Deep World. And I love all that you're doing. So like, even as you're just giving that intro and telling about the book, I remember, so I grew up going to church. My mom became a Christian, like second grade. And um, I had horrible teen years, like doing my own thing, but then like dedicated my life to God. And when as a young mom, I had one little baby uh, married to my husband and our church had like a Bible class. It was like a the, the pastor and another person would like teach. And I remember the first assignment is we had to go through every book of the Bible and we had to read it for ourselves. Like there was no book. We just were reading it for ourselves. We had to write like what the themes were, mm-hmm. who the author was. And it was like the best thing because even though I grew up in church, I like couldn't tell you if King David lived before Abraham or after Jesus. Like I had no concept <laughs> of any of it. And I was like, remember, it was like the world opened up to me. Like I could read this for myself. I can look at the themes and it was life changing. And now I love reading the Bible. I've been uh, reading through Leviticus and uh, this commentary. I'm like, every day when my husband gets up, I'm like, you will not believe what this verse in Leviticus means. And I get so excited. But I think many women don't realize like we can read the Bible for ourselves. We can understand it. We can apply it to our lives. And we don't have to just depend on a podcast 
podcast or a women's conference or a sermon to get like God's truth into our hearts. No, we don't. And I love that when you were a young mom, um, coming out of, you know, your teen years and everything that, you know, you had walked through that somebody took the time to guide you to study the Bible for Mm -hmm. yourself. Because so often what we do is we think, well, women particularly, I don't know why specific to women, but it just tends to be a women's ministry thing. We tend to give newer believers, um, here's a Bible study that you can fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. Um, And we don't really treat them as capable of understanding the Bible themselves with some guidance, reading the Bible for themselves, learning the context, you know, when King David lived and, and, and what the culture was like. If we give people those tools, that will actually enable them to have a stronger faith and more confidence in scripture itself, instead of having to go from devotional to devotional or Bible study to Bible study. And those things aren't bad at all, but I think we need to be very balanced in whether we're, you know, how much we're using those and how much we're enabling people to study the Bible on their own. Yeah. And I think that is just so important. And when we start studying it on our own, I think another important thing, which is I know what you talk about, I think so many times through these messages, it's all about me. And really, yeah. it's, no, it's about God. Like, it's about <laughs> God. And I think my turning point later when, okay, you know, because I was reading the Bible and I was, I read it all the way through and I was so proud of myself. But like the turning point in my life came when it was like, oh, it's about God. And what is he doing right now and how can I join him? And uh, like, how does he want to impact my community? And what is my part instead of me saying, you know, all about me and my future. And it was once I started seeing like, Oh, I can see God is at work here. He led me to help start a crisis pregnancy center. Mm -hmm. He led me to minister to teen moms and share my story. We adopted kids because all of a sudden, instead of saying like, what's my good future, blah, blah, blah. It was like, God says here to care for the orphans and the widows. Like, I think he's pretty serious about that. So how do I need to take that scripture and what do we need to do? So I think it's just this whole other switch, which, which I love how you talk about that. It's, I think so many times, when we hear these, you know, devotionals and stuff, it's like, oh, that just gave me warm fuzzies for the day. <laughs> Instead right. of like, God's word is for me to walk out, and it's about Him and His purposes, and I have a part in that. Yes, but it's not just the warm fuzzies. Yes, exactly. It's very much a cultural approach. The way we tend to read the Bible now Mm -hmm. um, is a cultural American, especially approach to the Bible. Um, And this shift actually happened back in the 40s and 50s. It was actually the first time the term quiet time appeared in Christian literature was in a pamphlet Mm -hmm. from InterVarsity Press. And since then, you know, like people, I think, assume that the quiet time has always been around or that it's in the Bible somewhere, but the concept really emerged in the fifties and was promoted by Billy Graham. And again, if, when we look at quiet time itself, is it bad? No, but Mm -hmm. there was a shift in focus right around that time from an outward faith or an intercessory type of faith that was, you know, praying for the orphan and the widow and very active to a, inner focused faith. And then Mm. the 60s and the 70s happened. You added some more mysticism on top of that. And now you've got a faith that really is about me unless you consciously bring it back to what scripture says that this is about God and his story and his work. We get to partner with his work, but that means we have to be looking at him and not looking at ourselves. Yeah, that is so good. I love like one of your quotes that I like have highlighted, starred, it says, stop preaching the easy message and start preaching the right one. I was mm-hmm. like, oh my goodness, like I'm, that's, that's so highlighted and underlined and all this stuff because I think we're almost afraid we're going to offend people and we want them, you know, to, I don't know, I don't know, we don't want to cause conflict and so it's right. just like we're easy and we're kind to people and and instead of saying, no, what does God want you to do? And how do you need to be reaching outside of yourself? And I love how you also brought out like the cultural thing, because culturally, it was when Jesus was teaching, it was like, this is about God. This isn't about you and your quiet time. It's right. about God. And uh, I think I think until we understand that the lies that we've been giving really are just to 
just to make ourselves more comfortable instead of really getting outside of our comfort zone is where God wants us. He wants us outside of our comfort zone. He wants us doing the hard things. He wants us walking out his word in real ways. And I love how you're like, okay, let's just talk about this. Like, <laughs> Stop calling me beautiful. <laughs> Stop telling me I'm a princess. Like, yes, let's, let's talk about the truth. And so I love that you're doing that. Oh, thanks, Trisha. Yeah. So, okay. When you first like wrote this message, I know it was a blog post that went viral. Like, did that surprise you that so many people like really connected with the message? I was a little bit surprised. I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, I got some backlash, you know, I think with any message, people will misunderstand what you're saying and think that you're saying, you know, we should never tell women that they're beautiful daughters of the king or, you know, right. <laughs> it's yeah. all or nothing, which is definitely not what I was saying in the blog post or in the book, but that the primary message that we need to be preaching needs to be one of depth. And the gospel is deep stuff. It's got some hard Mm -hmm. stuff. It means talking about sin and talking about our need for a savior, because there's no point for a savior if you don't need one. And we like to leave off that first half of the gospel because it's very uncomfortable and say, you are loved by God. You're a beautiful daughter of the King. Well, there's something that had to happen for that identity Mm -hmm. to be actualized. And that was repentance and seeking the Lord and, and acknowledging our sin. And so when we fail to do that, then we fail to acknowledge that first half, we actually cheapen the gospel. And I was pleasantly surprised by how many women identified with that message and really resonated with it, asked for it, said, we are tired of pink fluff theology. Mm -hmm. And I think it doesn't satisfy our soul. Like like we think it's going to be easy for people and this is great for them, but inside we want something more and we want something deeper. And so when, I mean, just when I'm opening up the Bible and I read a scripture and I start looking more and how can I apply this to my life? And this is going to be really hard, but I need God in the heart. Like I need that relationship with him. I need him to give me faith and to, to help me take those steps. And it's growing in the relationship with him as we do the hard things. And that's where we find him. So I think it's so important, like when we start getting to his word and applying it to ourselves, that that he becomes alive to us in ways that we never experienced before. Yes, absolutely agree. All right. So I know that you love to talk about studying scripture and, and um, just encourage women to do that. And I would just love for you to like, maybe there's someone listening today, like, okay, I'm starting to understand what you guys are saying. And I'm, yes, I'm going to go get the book, which I encourage everyone to do. But like today, how can I start studying scripture and applying it to myself? Well, the first thing I would say is to pick a place to start. And if you need a reading plan or something to give you structure, absolutely use one. I would not start with a, you read the Bible in a year plan. (laughs) Don't stick yourself on some super demanding, rigid schedule that's going to make you feel like a failure because the point of this is not to check it off. The point of this is Mm -hmm. to learn who God is through scripture because that's where he primarily reveals himself and the Holy Spirit brings to light the truths that are there and guides you and, and teaches you. So pick somewhere to start. So if you've never read the Bible on your own before, I would say somewhere like John is a good start. And I often say flip-flopping between the New and the Old Testament can be good because the New Testament is often easier for people to understand, um, largely written to Greek-speaking cultures reflecting some of that that viewpoint um, and culture, which more, more accurately echoes ours today um, than Hebrew culture does. So Mm -hmm. a little bit easier to understand. So then going to the Old Testament, and then I would say, take notes. Now, Trisha, when we met, I was a college academic counselor. So you know, I have opinions about (laughs) note taking. Um, Note taking increases retention by as much as 40%. Mm -hmm. And so when you're reading, it's so important that that if at all possible, at least three times a week to sit down and write out your thoughts, your questions, things that stand out to you as you are reading the text, because you can then use those as jumping off points to look up articles, to get a commentary or a Bible encyclopedia or your study Bible and follow the cross-references and find out the answers to some of your questions. 
asking questions is not bad or wrong. It's how we learn. So questioning the Bible or even being uncomfortable with things that you see in it, that's not wrong. That's the starting point for your research. And I think in a lot of these Bible studies that we do, we're very focused on personal application. And if it doesn't Mm -hmm. apply directly to our lives today, um, we aren't interested. And that's why we find much of the Old Testament boring because we think this has to apply to my life in 2020 America when this is a story about God. And those principles carry over to every day and age. But to pull those out, you've got to be willing to wrestle with some difficult texts to do that. Yeah. And I think it is like, like, I love how you said, just write your questions down. And the amazing thing is when we take time to write the questions down, it's amazing that a scripture will come up later or it's like, oh, wow, that ties into my questions. Um, And, and God is so good about bringing those things up. But I love, you know, you talk about, okay, let's look it up. What does the scripture mean? And one of my favorite things, I know you have a resource, Bible study resources um, on your website, which is just your name. And we will spell that out in the show notes and have all the link there but i love also bible hub yes because bible hub on the bottom has like commentaries and it has multiple commentaries and so i will read a verse and i will just go and like scan the commentaries like okay what are these people saying and it has scriptures that are like connected to it on the side and that's like one of my favorite things for an easy like let me just get a basic understanding of the scripture um to click over like okay this this is actually a quote that jesus was quoting from a psalm you know (laughs) so it's it's really cool just in the one easy website which is bible hub you can kind of click around on that one page when you put a verse in and there's information to take you deeper and it gets exciting when you're like oh my goodness i had no idea that that was a psalm that jesus was quoting and of course his listeners probably realized it was a song. Right. And, um, I love that. Yeah. And Bible Gateway and Blue Letter Bible are also great resources like that too. Blue Letter Bible is probably a little bit more intense. You can do more word analysis and, and look mm-hmm. up like what's the Hebrew mean and other terms for it. Um, but you can use so many great resources today that can help you dig deeper into, into the word on your own time. Yeah. And I love, you also talk about um, misreading the Bible in with Western eyes and some yes. of those resources. And I think that has helped me so much too, um, which is just like, okay, this is how the culture then was understanding what was being said. And, yeah. um, and, and I love this type of books. My daughter, actually, she's a missionary in the Czech Republic. She started sending me links like, mom, you need to read this book. And I, I love where it's like, okay, it helps so much to understand like this is the culture of the time. Instead of, again, like you're saying uh american culture 2020 like that we see things completely different than how they saw things back then yes and a couple others just because we're talking about this if people want to like deep dive into this um the jewish jesus and reading the bible with rabbi jesus are both super helpful also for understanding cultural context for who Jesus was and the whole Old Testament, because Jesus was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. He quoted it constantly. Um, And so when we're reading it, like you're saying, Trisha, like we bring our lens to it and we can be like, that was really rude or, or this is weird. Why is he saying this? And when we understand the context, like the early church would have, everything makes more sense. And we actually have more principles to apply and to understand in our daily life. Yeah, another one I love that I'm going through right now um, with the online group of my writer friends is Jesus and Women um, by Christy McClelland. Have you heard of that one? I haven't. Okay, so she um, takes you back and explains like Jewish culture and then also how revolutionary the way Jesus approached women was like slapping everyone in the face because it was just like it was so it's so good i mean it was he was so clearly um giving them importance and uh, reverence and stuff that they had not had in the culture for a very long time and so that's another one jesus and women bible study um that i'm going through right now that's really good again it goes back to like this is the culture of the time and this is what was going on and this is how women were treated and this is what jesus did and i'm just like loving it. So, I mean, definitely read Stop Calling Me Beautiful and then dig into some of these resources that we're talking about. And, um, you know, then it doesn't become like, oh, I have to sit down for my 15 minutes. It's like, I am so excited about what God is going to show me today. And it just becomes a beautiful um, just learning experience is a relationship. Like I remember 
even years as I was reading through the Bible in a year, Jesus like pause like you don't need to follow that reading plan it wasn't like an audible voice but like connect with me here like we don't need to we don't need to finish the next two chapters like we need to sit on this for a while and it is it does that relationship grows as we spend time in god's word yes absolutely um so i love what i mean what you're teaching in this book what you're sharing in this book how have you seen like now that it's out there and now that people are reading it what are people saying and how are you seeing how it's impacting people? Well, one of the most positive things that I've seen come out of this is just this renewed desire to be in relationship with God, which is all I could mm-hmm. ever ask for out of a book. Right. You know, um, this excitement about going deeper and and asking deeper questions and, and digging into why they believe what they believe, seeing that our theology, so theology means the study of the nature of God, our understanding of the nature of God shapes how we respond to things like grief and anxiety mm-hmm. and fear and people pleasing. Those seem like isolated issues, and the tendency in women's ministry is to write a Bible study to that issue, which you can do. You can pull passages out that apply. You can even learn great stuff through them. I've done those kinds of studies myself, but ultimately, we've got to go back to the foundation and say, is my understanding of the nature of God accurate? Does it match up with what Christianity teaches? Does it match up with God is what God has said about himself? If it does, that changes everything. That changes how I respond to legalism, how I respond mm-hmm. to sexual sin. It changes it because my understanding of God is transforming my inner relationship with God. Mm-hmm. Okay, wait, wait. I want you to go. I want you to keep going here because I think this is so, so important. Because growing up, like I mentioned, my mom became a Christian when I was in second grade. It was so much about rules and got to do this, don't do this, got to wear a dress to church, don't do that. You know, I mean, all the all the rules and I, so many people that when we grow up in church, we kind of know what those rules are. But then when I was a teenager and started, you know, sleeping with my boyfriend, I just like ignored God because I was breaking the rules. So I don't have any, I don't want to even think that he's out there. But then when I needed him as a pregnant teenager, I had to like start looking at myself and looking at my sin and then understanding like, okay, God has forgiven me. Who does he want me to be? But I think so many times because it's a rule-based thing. We almost push God away when we can't keep all the rules. So I'd just love you to, to talk more about just what you were saying about understanding like the connection with God in the relationship and not just legalism. Yeah. I think parents grasp this more than anyone else. <laughs> and before I had kids, I know that I didn't get it as much as I do now that I have them. But if you think about this, the a, a father relationship, which is how God has chosen to reveal himself as a father, mm-hmm. um, both to Jesus and then to all of those who are in Christ. So we are all children of God. That's the pattern he's giving. Um, is that a parent, a loving, perfect parent like him, wants the very best for that child and they know the very best for that child. And so there are boundaries And there are standards that must be complied with in order to have that best. But the the rules aren't what the relationship is about. The relationship Mm -hmm. is about the person. And so we tend to think like of God as an authority figure and allow our negative experiences with humans to shape our view of God instead of looking to God as this, you know, ultimate entity who is perfectly holy, perfectly loving, perfectly just, and allow our view of him to transform our view of humanity, both of our parents and our coworkers and of ourself. So when we're looking at this this issue with the rule-based Christianity, which is essentially legalism is what it is, we have to be careful that we're not adding on to what God commanded and then blaming Mm -hmm. God for it. You know, it, you know, having a church that says, well, if your skirt isn't to your knee, then you're shamed and we're not going to talk to you and, um, you know, we'll make you feel bad about yourself. Well, there's nothing in scripture that says that your skirt has to be to your knee. There's a lot of scripture that talks about humility of spirit and not intentionally mm-hmm. drawing attention to yourself, but that's a heart issue. And 
God's heart is for you to walk in humility. That's his heart. And so the skirt length isn't what he's looking at. He's looking at the heart. And so we can't blame God for the negative behaviors of a church or a parent. We have to go back to scripture and see what does scripture really say? What is God saying about how he wants me to live? And there's a lot of freedom in that. So such freedom that actually a lot of Christians aren't comfortable with it. It's too much mm-hmm. freedom. And they want right. to add on to it to make sure that people aren't sinning in specific ways. But even like, you know, we're talking about sleep, you, you when you were a teenager sleeping with your boyfriend, and I have a history of sexual sin myself. The issue was never the the action, right? It was the heart behind it. And God was after a heart that saw that loved him so much that my sexual behavior followed my love mm. for him. It wasn't the issue. Yes, it was offensive to him that I was sinning sexually, but the real issue, why I was doing that was that I didn't trust God. I did not love him. Right. And so that's what we as a church and as women need to get back to is, okay, the real issue here isn't what's visible. The issue is these people don't trust and love God. So how can we get them to understand who God is so that they are transformed by who God is. Oh, that's so good. I am thinking back to a time when I was really struggling um, just with like memories of my past and stuff I'd done. And some of my writer friends prayed for me. And I remember that night as I'm praying and go- going to sleep, I thought back to those times that I just didn't want to think about, you know, times I'm with my boyfriend and, uh, you know, chose to have an abortion, those, those things I really regretted. And for the first time, I let Jesus like let myself imagine him there. And what I saw was just him weeping, not mm-hmm. because like, you horrible person you're doing these things but like he had so much more for me and he was just weeping because he wanted me to know his love and I was seeking it in all these other ways and fear was causing you know me to make really bad decisions and just that image that you know he gave me that night as I was praying of him just weeping with compassion and tenderness and love for me not because it was like you're horrible and I hate you and right. you're making all these but like I love you and I have so much more for you and I cannot wait till you discover that love was like like transforming in my heart. And I think it's so important. And like, even with our kids, you know, I mean, I have 10 kids, goodness. <laughs> you, we could teach them like, don't do this and don't do that. But as soon as they leave the house, if it's just the rules, they're going to, you know, they're going to do the things because it's not in their heart. Right. But when we explain like, this is why we want you to, you know, what, you know, this is why we were saying these things because we want a good future for you. We want to help you, right. you know, this is what God's word said. I think it's such a different thing. And I love, 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 love how, you know, you are just pointing women back to that, that relationship and not just the legalism and not just the skirt length or all the things that really understanding that father heart of God. Yeah. Yeah. He's so, so good. And I think the more it's, it's a combination of knowing what scripture says about him, but also experiencing him. You know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's both and Christian faith is knowledge and experience. And if you have one without the other, you can either end up with a really screwy theology of who God is or a rule-based Christianity. And he has this middle road for us. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that. And I think when we discover that when we're in God's word for ourselves and we're, you know, understanding this and understanding his heart and um, experiencing that time with him and walking out the things that we feel called to do. And he's right there. I mean, it's so this, this deeper part than just, you know, filling in the blanks of a Bible study or, um, you know, it's, it's so much more. So I'm so thankful that you're online and you have your books and your blogs and that you're just encouraging this and your podcast. So let's talk a little bit about your podcast um, and what you're doing there because it is so cool. Yeah. So Verity is the name of the podcast, which means truth. Verity means truth. Funny story about that. I love the name Verity. I think I might have gotten it from the show Poldark if you've ever watched Poldark. Um, I haven't. It's really good. It's a PBS masterpiece. Anyway, um, there's a character named Verity. And so I looked up the name and I realized it means truth. And so I begged my husband to let me have this name for a girl. I'm pregnant, by the way, with our third baby. So um, I begged for this name and he just was not a fan. So I was like, well, you know what? (laughs) I'll name my podcast and my conference the name that I want. (laughs) 
<laughs> and and I think it really works because like it's the same Latin root that when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, he's saying, truly, truly, I say unto you. And mm-hmm. what we're after mm-hmm. is truth. So Verity is the podcast, not the child. And the podcast is really about... I'm um, digging into church history and theology in a way that makes sense to the girl who maybe isn't a big reader, isn't going to go to seminary. Um, and our latest series is about the history of how the Bible was compiled. So how did we get the Bible that we have today? It certainly didn't drop from the sky the way it is now. Um, we have done, we're finishing up the series. It'll be a 12 part series that has talked about from the beginning, Genesis to Revelation, how the Bible was put together and questions about translation processes, the KJV, all that jazz. That is so cool. And I just remember, again, um, one of the books I read was What the Bible's All About by Henrietta Mears. Mm -hmm. And it talks about, you know, so many books are history books, so many books are poetry books. I've never learned that. I'm like, how can I have gone to church my whole life and not even known how the book, the Bible was broken up? But I love how you're, you know, some of the recent podcasts is about Bible translation and English Bible and history and the canon. I mean, I love that it's like, we are learning and it helps us understand the Bible better. And you just do it in such a simple way that I love it. So thank you. Thank you again for doing that. Oh, I'm so glad that you've enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. So what do you have plans? I know. Okay. I didn't know you're pregnant again. That is so cool. Yup. Yup. Three, three, three kiddos over here. So yeah. (laughs) Yup. I love it. And then, so are you working on more books or what is your plan for yeah, that? Yeah, we have a couple projects going on right now. I'm not at liberty to say what okay. is next, but we do have something coming or I have something coming. And I also have quite a few ebooks that I promote. So they aren't traditionally published books. I write them and then I just post them to my website for sale affordably. Awesome. Um, we have a theology basics book coming out this summer. We have a Bible study basics book that's going to be out this month in June when we're recording um, a singleness one, a sexuality one. So there's a lot of different options that we have on my website as well as traditionally published paperback books. I love that. Okay. Conference. We're just going to talk about all the things here. because yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Verity Conference would be in its third year, unfortunately, because of COVID and our event space, not knowing when they'd be booking mm-hmm. again. Mm-hmm. We had to mm-hmm. cancel for 2020, but we will be back in 2021. But typically it's held in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And we generally just do really simple um, theology-based sessions for anybody who wants to come. And we've tried to really cultivate kind of a community aspect. They're very small right now. Our first one was 80. Our next one was 130. And we anticipate around 250 or so for the next one. And so people get to meet women who share their values and their love for going deeper in the faith from all around the nation and world. Yeah. And I just love how, you know, you started with the blog and then like the God just takes his, takes us on this journey that he's like, okay, and here, here's some women I want you to teach. Here's a conference I want you to do. I want you to just explain this in a podcast. And it really is us taking out those taking those steps of faith. So I just want to end on that for maybe someone who is thinking like, I have been thinking about starting a blog or starting a podcast, or maybe even having a Bible study in a Zoom meeting with friends. Um, Just what encouragement would you have for them who think like, I cannot do this. I, I know Felicia can do it. Trisha can do it, but I cannot do that. What encouragement would you have for them? Oh man. I would just say that if you are focusing on God, God will show up. Christ will show up and he will give the words. He'll give the direction. You keep scripture central. You keep the focus on him. It's not about us as leaders or teachers or speakers, right? Facilitating is something we can learn as we go. Um, And the only time you go wrong is when you make it all about you. So if you keep it about him, and you keep directing the people that are either reading your stuff or following you on Instagram or at, in your home for a Bible study, you keep redirecting them back to the Lord, then he will lead you wherever you need to go with that group. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. And I think I love the scripture where it talks about in our weakness, God's strength is complete. 
Um, and I always like would cling to that. Like I only have my high school diploma and I'm writing books, <laughs> but it's like, it's not about me. It's about God and the messages he's given me, not the people I'm supposed to interview. And, um, when we are weak in these areas, he shows up when we you know depend on him. And of course we need to get the training and, um, you know, make, make sure our work is as good as it can be. But really it is about God wanting to work in us and through us for his glory. And it's about mm-hmm. that. It's about the message and the people that we can impact. Yes, I agree. Well, awesome. Okay, so where can people find all things Felicia? So they can find me on Instagram. That's probably my most popular platform. We do a lot of stories and Ask Anything Monday and Bible quizzes on Fridays and fun stuff like that. Also on Facebook. And I have a website, so FeliciaMasonheimer.com. And all my platforms are the same, Felicia Masonheimer. Which you'll probably yes, have and, to spell in those show notes. <laughs> um, no, go, well, yeah, we're gonna spell, we'll go ahead and spell it real quick because maybe they want to look you up before they're gonna go click through. So why don't you spell um, your name real quick? Yeah, so it's Felicia, but it's spelled P H Y L I C I A, and then my last name Masonheimer is spelled just like it sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your your first name is the one that's like okay, it's Felicia. <laughs> it's Ph though. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there are no other Felicia Masonheimers in the world, so you no. will have no problem finding me. <laughs> yeah, I love it, and I really just encourage um, listeners out there to, to check out the book. Stop calling me beautiful. Um, I think it is so encouraging, and then blogs and all the things. So um, really, really good stuff. But Felicia, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you, Trisha. Well, friend, I am just so thankful for what Felicia had to share. And I just love so many things that she had to say. We need freedom, not compliments. I love the title. Stop calling me beautiful. That makes you like, what? (laughs) And I just love that it's all about, um, we just don't need to be told that we're beautiful, but we can go deeper with our eyes, listening for God's voice, um, discovering more about him, realizing that he has a good plan for us, letting his transforming power work at us, work in us. And this all comes through studying scripture and really knowing God and his plan for us, for ourselves. And I think so many times it gets easy just to listen to a podcast, not that I'm saying you shouldn't, because I really enjoy you being here or listening to a sermon instead of getting down, sitting down, getting in God's word and really letting God's word speak to us. I think that's where pure um, and beautiful transformation happens. So I'm really thankful that Felicia is just talking about all these things and um, that she wants us to go deeper because she has seen how her life has transformed. And I have seen also how, how my life has transformed because we've gotten into God's word and we really have made an effort to understand it for ourselves. So today's Walk It Out scripture, it's two verses, 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have a taste of the Lord's kindness. And I just love that. The more we have a taste of the Lord's kindness, we will crave that spiritual milk, that nourishment that will help us grow and understand our salvation in in new ways. And so I'm so thankful for that, that, that God gives us a taste of it and makes us want more and more of his word and of him. So let me just pray for us now. Lord, I thank you so much that you have given us your word and that you have so much in it for us, that you have so much nourishment to give us life and truth, truth and abundant life, and that you want to um, just transform our minds and our hearts so that we can see you in this world and see you and how you want to work in our lives. Lord, I pray for Felicia. I pray that you will bless her as she speaks and ministers to women. I pray that you will um, guide her as she's a, a mom with these young kids and this baby on the way, Lord, that you will just help her um, just to balance it all, Lord. I pray for everyone listening that we will just grow in a desire, and this me included, grow in a desire to sit down in your word more and more, that as we continue to taste how good you are and how good your words are, that we will just crave that and want it more and be nourished and grow fuller into who you have designed us to be. I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for Um, your encouragement. I thank you for how you've used 
um, Felicia to inspire us today. And in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I think it's so cool that Felicia and I met because she went to one of my workshops about how to write and how to balance kids and writing at home. And even right now, as I'm doing this, um, I'm in my room. My bed is not even made. I, it's half made. I started that and never got around to finishing it. I've had dogs scratching on the door. I could hear the kids running up and down the stairs, which my bedroom, uh, we didn't realize how loud it would be. But the stairs run like on the outside wall of our bedroom. So we could hear the kids. So this is everyday life. Um, it's not like I'm able to get away and sequester myself in a cabin and write and record podcasts. Uh, it sounds amazing, but that is not real life. And I just love to encourage people on how to, to do that in real life. So if you've ever wanted to write a book, I would love for you to find out information about my private subscription group called write that book and the same type of encouragement I gave to that workshop Felicia first attended when we met um, I give that same type of inspiration and teaching and and help and then also I in, have invited other experts, professional writers and editors and agents and marketing staff, um, script writers, you name it. I've, my producer friend in Hollywood has done numerous office hours. And so every month, you know, a dozen times a month, there's someone there giving an hour of their time to teach. If you would like more information, go to the show notes and we will have all the information about um write that book or you can go to teachable and search for write that book with Trisha Goyer and it should pop up. It's $24.95 a month. You don't have to um, subscribe for like a year. You just do it month to month, try it out. If it's not for you, that's okay. We still love you. I still love you. But if you've ever considered wanting to write, whether it's a book or a blog or anything, um, check it out. Well, friend, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for just how you inspire me by showing up and it just encourages me to get um, more amazing guests on for you. So I just pray that you will have a wonderful week. Thanks for listening to Walk It Out. Head over to the show notes for this podcast and all past episodes at www.walkitoutpodcast.com. If you love the show, share it with someone you know who can make a radical difference in the world. We love new friends. 